2017 World Dairy Expo. Today's seminar, Making Sense of Dairy and Anti-Inflammation, Yogurt, Obesity, and A2 Milk. The speaker today is Dr. Bradley Bowling, Assistant Professor, Department of Food Science, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dairy consumption may benefit the immune system by having an anti-inflammatory effect. The consumption of milk and processing may affect anti-inflammatory activity of dairy products. A2 milk is gaining recognition in the U.S. dairy industry in part because of its health claims. More producers are choosing to breed cattle to express the A2 gene and supply an emerging specialty market. Dr. Bradley Bowling will lead a discussion on the complex demand of A2 milk and the claims and evidence for its beneficial effects on the human body. Bowling, an assistant professor in the food science department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, concentrates his research on food chemistry and nutrition. He leads research on dietary components that can reduce the risk of chronic diseases, focusing on antioxidant and anti-inflammatory efforts. In this seminar, Bowling will discuss a link between yogurt, gut health, and its benefits. He will also outline the connection between inflammation and chronic diseases and claims of how A1 and A2 milk can improve health. This seminar has been approved for continuing education credits from the American Registry of Professional Animal Science and the American Association of Veterinarian State Boards, RACE program. Forms are available in the back if you are interested in RACE credits. Also a reminder to please fill out your 2017 Expo Seminar evaluation and turn it in at the end of the program. I would like to ask everyone to please silence their cell phones at this time. Now, let's hear it from Dr. Bowling. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you're having a great and wonderful time here at the, at the Expo. Thank you for uh, coming to this presentation, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to share uh, about our research and um, my uh, assessment of the, the evidence about A2 milk. First, I need to kind of review this area of inflammation, so I think we can get on the same page for uh, what types of effects we mean when we're talking about inflammation. And I, I think, you know, inflammation has gotten a bad reputation, um, but I just want to point out that we, that we do need inflammation for our immune system to function properly. We need it for defense against uh, pathogens, against microorganisms that may uh, cause harm to our body. And uh, we also need inflammation to promote healing after wound, after a wound or a broken bone or uh, a sickness or illness or something like this. So the immune system is very important for the normal function of the body and inflammation is a part of, of that process. And uh, the immune system is really complicated, in part because there are so many cells, uh, so many uh, proteins, so many uh, chemicals that go into coordinating an immune response. In fact, uh, subsets of immune cells, which by that I mean certain populations of these specific cell classes, are being discovered in the last two to three years. I mean, it's really, uh, really fascinating and uh, very interesting for, for how complicated the immune system is. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, going into just the number of cells, but also the types of proteins and molecules they excrete to create some sort of beneficial or harmful, harmful response. These are called either cytokines, which are proteins or uh, amino acids, uh, I mean groups of amino acids, peptide chains, or chemokines, which are chemicals that these cells might secrete to promote or resolve in inflammation. Uh, recently, uh, it's been recognized that the, that the gut is a very important site of immune function. Um, this is because many of the components of the gut microbiota, or the microbes that are living in the gut, 
uh, interact with cells at the mucosal membranes to drive the way that these cells differentiate. And by, the, by this, I mean how these populations of immune cells mature. Also, we have pro-inflammatory components coming from the gut, and I'll explain that in, in a little bit more detail in a little bit. Uh, but first, I need to introduce the concept of chronic inflammation, uh, because this is really where the anti-inflammatory effects of foods uh, lie. Uh, chronic inflammation is different from the wound healing and the pathogen defense that I mentioned earlier, in that the cr chronic inflammation is really a low-grade or low-level inflammation that is unresolved. So imagine you get sick or you, get, you have some sort of wound healing. Over time, the, the inflammatory response will resolve itself. But in chronic inflammation, uh, there's a low level of inflammatory process kind of throughout the body, and it's not really uh, resolved, and which kind of per perpetuates the, the damage in, in the body. And this type of inflammation has been associated either with the pathology, so how these diseases arise or really how they're, they maintain in their disease state. So many chronic diseases, Alzheimer's, arthritis, cancer, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, uh, and many other chronic diseases have inflammation as, chronic inflammation as some component of, of those diseases. And it, it's really concerning, um, and chronic inflammation is a, a concern because uh, more than half of individuals in the U.S. have a chronic disease, probably where inflammation is a component. And it's approaching 90% of the healthcare costs are really due to uh, chronic types of conditions in, in, the, in the U.S. So uh, it, it's, it's of interest to control chronic, chronic inflammation. And confounding this is the increasing rates of obesity um, in the U.S. and, and in, in other countries. Uh, obesity contributes to chronic inflammation, uh, one, by having uh, more nutrients available for immune cells to perform their pro-inflammatory or chronic inflammatory actions. Uh, obesity is also associated with certain types of microbes that are more inflammatory th than others. Also, something called a leaky gut, so components of those microbes can translocate across the intestinal barrier, which normally would segregate uh, th those microbes and stimulate inflammation. And, and, and also, uh, the adipose tissue associated with obesity has exposure to immune cells which have infiltrated those tissues and have been producing those cytokines and those chemokines, those things that kind of perpetuate that in chronic inflammation. I have a picture from uh, a research group at, at Harvard uh, of the adipose tissue. So here are the adipose cells, these large white structures, and then you can see these um, small purple-looking cells. These are the immune cells that are integrated in the adipose tissue, and they're excreting these chronic inflammatory components, which kind of perpetuate that uh, Im chronic immune response. So uh, what can we do about it? Uh, if you go to the bookstore, uh, you can buy <laughs> any number of books. I didn't choose these ones for any particular reason. I just want to point out that, uh, you know, this is an, a, uh, an area where people have made uh, a lot of claims about foods, fruits, vegetables, uh, dairy products, um, seafood. There's been a lot of uh, interest in, in how food or dietary patterns can prevent chronic inflammation. And I think this is one of the reasons, and I'm going to introduce a little bit more about nutrition research, but maybe um, you're of the opinion that nutrition is very confusing. Uh, nutritionists really don't have a good idea of, what, of, what's, of what's going on. And, uh, you know, this is, this is um, it, it, nutrition can be, can be very, very confusing, uh, oftentimes because uh, study results get published or publicized really before we have a good understanding of the field, and I'll, and I'll explain that, what I mean by that, in, in a little bit more detail here. So when you think about how nutritional recommendations uh, be, be kind of get enacted, uh, it, we have multiple lines of evidence to, to suggest that a certain diet or certain food component may act in a certain way. So I'll just keep it in the realm of anti-inflammatory foods. 
So there's the field of epidemiology, and this type of evidence involves surveying lots and lots of people, thousands and thousands of people, taking their health records, their uh, dietary composition, sometimes biomarkers of, of, of inflammation, and linking those patterns to say, okay, eating a certain pattern or eating, eating a certain way, these people have less inflammation. That's what we call an association. It can't really prove cause and effect, but you know, if a group of people consistently eat dairy and they have lower chronic inflammation, well, you know, that's telling us maybe that there's a relationship there. Uh, there we also have preclinical studies. So something by that I mean something conducted in a test tube, uh, cultured cells, uh, and maybe a mouse model of a certain disease, looking at a particular mechanism for how a food might impact an inflammatory pathway. So let's say we know these cells will produce uh, some of these inflammatory uh, cytokines or proteins. We can add uh, milk or, or yogurt or something else to this and, and monitor how those cells respond to that. Uh, the limitation to this type of studies is that this is not a full human organism, right? Mice have different digest slightly different digestive systems, um, different populations of immune cells. Um, culturing cells like this may neglect digestion or metabolism that could be important for how a, a food affects. So we need to take these with, we need to put these in, in uh, a broader context and our knowledge of how a nutrient might be absorbed or, or acted upon. And then really the gold standard here uh, for generating evidence are human intervention studies. And by this, I mean we have a population of people. Uh, we give them uh, an intervention. This may be uh, eating yogurt, for example. Uh, you know, some may receive a treatment. Some may receive a placebo, uh, which is meant to mimic the treatment but not maybe have that, that active component. Uh, there would be some aspect of blinding. So by that, we mean... The people who are consuming this don't know whether they're getting the placebo or the control. Uh, and furthermore, the investigators don't know which group they're getting until the analysis of the study is complete. That potentially limits any, any bias uh, for, for these types of studies. Uh, but as you can imagine, it's very difficult to have a placebo for a food, right? Unless, uh, you know, what would you use as a placebo for milk? Um, you know, if you give soy milk or, or you know, some other non-dairy type of beverage, someone is going to be able to tell really easily. So uh, nutritional studies typically don't have that same type of, type of advantage. Uh, furthermore, one drawback for these, these are incredibly expensive to conduct. So uh, many human intervention studies in nutrition are very small. By that I mean tens, 20, 30 people. Uh, whereas in drug type studies where we are generating a lot of evidence, this would be in the thousands. You know, that's why it takes billions of dollars to uh, generate evidence or bring, bring a drug to market. Um, nowhere near a billion dollars has ever been invested into a, a, a single food item for, for studying this in terms of human intervention, intervention studies. So we're, we're dealing with really with a, a lower kind of uh, grade of, of evidence in, in, nutritional, in nutritional studies. Um, furthermore, uh, there may be many things that you need to consider when you're evaluating the strength of a human intervention study. Like I said, the number of participants, if it's very small, well, you, know, you haven't conducted it in, in a large enough group maybe to represent uh, a larger or broader population. Um, you know, whether that they've been blinded or ran randomized, uh, how much of the food you might give, you know, do they have one serving of milk, two servings of milk, how many weeks? Um, you know, what types of things were you controlling? What types of things could confound it? And also, when we're thinking about anti-inflammatory effects, what is the cause of inflammation? Is it a particular chronic disease? It is, is it a population with cardiovascular disease diagnosis? Is it a healthy population? You could have very different uh, types of effects. And furthermore, I, because I said the uh, immune system is very complex, what do you use as your biomarker? Are you looking at cell populations? Are you looking at specific proteins? There's, there's really a very large uh, context to understand when we say something might be inflammatory or anti-inflammatory. So I, I don't have an easy answer <laughs> for, for, for this, but um, what, what we typically have is a, a spectrum of evidence that go into making some sort of dietary recommendation. We have you know, emerging evidence. This may be um, 
small, you know, very small pilot studies uh, that have been done in human, human interventions, epidemiological studies, preclinical studies, kind of fall in this emerging evidence spectrum. Once you start to have multiple human intervention studies, even if they're smaller, you might move towards some scientific agreement. Uh, and then you might have some large uh, clinical trials, and then, and then you take a statistical analysis of all the research that has been done to that point in, in humans. That's called a meta-analysis. So you pool the results of these studies, you know, assuming that they're giving uh, similar types of doses, and you can look for a broader statistical effect in this. And then once you have really enough of this data to move towards scientific agreement, then you get uh, health claims, evidence that's been accepted by federal and professional organizations. And by that I mean uh, public health recommendations, the US dietary guidelines, FDA uh, authorized statements that you can put on, on foods. Uh, this is an example of health claims. We do have another type of claim uh, which uh, I just want to e explain kind of the difference because this makes a difference in, in how different products are claiming that they may, they may have an effect. So on a product label, on foods, there are uh, two types of major claims about food and health that you can, that you can make. One is a health, health claim. And this is, requires really that significant scientific agreement, consensus in the field. And there, there is one for uh, calcium and oste osteoporosis. So uh, it reads like this, you can put this on a label. Adequate calcium throughout life as part of a well-balanced diet may reduce the risk of osteoporosis. So this is a healthy person consuming a product rich in calcium, such as a dairy product, um, reduces the, that disease risk, osteoporosis. Um, the, uh, notice that this is not, will cure osteoporosis, right? That is a drug claim. And that we have a very strict criteria for making any types of drug claims on food. Uh, if, you, if you make a drug claim, the FDA treats it as a drug. And, and I'll get into that just a little bit more. But we have this other type of claim, uh, which requires no pre-approval. It just requires uh, maybe one or two human intervention studies to support this. Uh, and, and this would be uh, something like consumption of calcium b helps build strong bones. No disease there. It's just a normal structure or function of, of the body, really getting strong bones. That's, uh, that, that's, that's something that's been, been claimed. Um, you can find this on calcium supplements. You can find this on some dairy products as well, but you can see down here in this green box, uh, that's the structure function claim here. But uh, we, we do have foods kind of getting into this anti-inflammatory effects. Now the question is, is this a valid health claim? It, it has not been approved by the, by the FDA, and anytime you see something anti-inflammatory, that means you have some process of inflammation already there, which means you're in a disease state, which means it's a drug claim. So this is an unallowed, something saying a food is anti-inflammatory is a drug claim. Uh, and we say that for, in, in the U.S., and this is not true in all, in, in all countries, but in the U.S., these types of claims are reserved for, for medicines, for drugs, uh, something like ibu ibuprofen, which has a uh, uh, well-established anti-inflammatory effect. And the, the Federal Trade Commission, which, which uh, governs truth in advertising, uh, as, well as, the, as well as the FDA, which par participates in this kind of analysis, has gone after companies which make drug-like claims on their foods. So, uh, a probiotic supplement that said that it was going to cure diarrhea, reduce constipation. Um, they, had a, they had a settlement with the FTC. Um, the same for claims about weight loss. Um, also, these like pure anti-inflammatory. This is a cactus juice. I don't know if anyone's had cactus juice before. <laughs> uh, I, I haven't. I'd like to try it sometime. But um, they, were, they said, you know, reduce inflammation, detoxify, protect against premature aging. Uh, they had to pay their consumers back three and a half million dollars because of these, these claims that they're making. Uh, so it's well established in the market that we should not be making anti-inflammatory anti claims on, on foods. Uh, but, I say, you know, but we, we want to prevent chronic inflammation. Why can't we eat a food that prevents inflammation? Well, you know, just because we can't say it on a food doesn't mean it doesn't happen, right? And that really hasn't stopped people from investigating the anti-inflammatory 
effects of food. And there have been more than 25 different clinical trials in, uh, around the world that have investigated dairy products for preventing inflammation. And by this, I mean there's a dairy product intervention. It's not a part of a broad dietary, dietary pattern because there, there are other types of studies that, that are like this. Uh, so this, is, this has been a, a systematic review of, of the evidence, and they point out, uh, you know, there's a number of studies which show, some show uh, biomarkers that may change that suggest an anti-inflammatory effect. Some suggest a pro-inflammatory effect. Generally, uh, biomarkers that are pro-inflammatory uh, show up in study populations where the participants have some sort of al uh, hypersensitivity or allergy uh, to dairy. I mean, I guess that's kind of, you know, you'd expect that. Uh, or they, they may have a gastrointestinal disorder. Um, the most consistent effect for the anti-inflammatory uh, properties of foods actually have been in individuals with metabolic disorders. This includes uh, obesity. It's classified as, as a metabolic disorder. And in fact, uh, among this, uh, the studies that show anti-inflammatory effects in uh, populations with metabolic disorders, fermented dairy has been particularly um, consistent in having anti-inflammatory effects. So this is one of the reasons that um, our research group pursued uh, study, uh, a research study about yogurt consumption in preventing chronic inflammation associated with, with obesity. And I had to explain, before I talk about the study itself, I need to explain a little bit about our hypothesis because this is really a hypothesis-driven uh, study. And I want to tell you because some of the biomarkers that we're going to talk about are not the typical inflammatory biomarkers that you may, uh, that you may know or, or be, be paying attention to. So like I said before, gut health uh, is probably very important to the development of chronic inflammation. And here, this is my crude drawing of a gut. <laughs> uh, here is your, here's the inside uh, on the top here of the intestinal lumen. You have uh, microbes, you have food components. Um, you have these microbes getting broken down uh, as they approach the gut barrier by, by cells and, and other components. And then you have uh, lipid micelles, which are how you absorb fats from the diet. These can carry in some of the pro-inflammatory components from these microbes. We call these endotoxins. Uh, when you, in, in, and really, they interact with this, with this process of, of inflammation because the more of these end, bacterial endotoxins that we're exposed to, it seems, to, it seems to be that uh, drives the, the process of chronic inflammation. So these actually stimulate the production of chronic, uh, chronic inflammatory cytokines uh, from the immune cells. And as I said, with obesity, uh, it's known that, that that intestinal barrier is compromised to a certain extent. So that means more of these bacterial toxins can, can permeate through the intestinal barrier and stimulate chronic inflammation. And this is a kind of a, circ, a cyclical type of process. So, you know, you already have a leaky, a leaky uh, maybe there's already a leaky gut, and then more and more of these uh, inflammatory cytokines just kind of maintain that chronic inflammation state. Um, so, so the way that we kind of measure this in, in our study is to look at the proteins that help detoxify those bacterial endo endotoxins. And, uh, what, the way that these are shuttled to immune cells to promote inflammation is you have um, this LPS, lipopolysaccharide binding protein, which takes this to a receptor on a cell, and then you stimulate that inflammatory cascade down on the bottom right. Uh, you have a protein called soluble CD14, SCD14, and this can combine with LBP and detoxify the LPS and shield really kind of prevent it from activating that immune response. And so now you can think like, well, if you have more SCD14 uh, and, and maybe less LBP, you'd have less of a chronic inflammatory uh, response. And there are also uh, antibodies in the plasma which will bind to LPS. And the more of these you have in your plasma indicates the less LPS that someone has been e exposed to. So these are just some of the, the markers that we would measure in a study to say, well, is uh, a diet having some sort of anti-inflammatory effect? And then we'd measure these downstream uh, products of the cells, interleukin-6, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF-alpha, high-sensitive uh, high um, uh, C-reactive protein, 
These are just typical inflammatory biomarkers that, that people might use. So for our study, uh, we took uh, yogurt or a non-dairy control snack, and we looked long and hard for what would be the best <laughs> control for the study. The best thing that we could come up with is soy pudding. I mean, they sell it, uh, and you know, it's, not, it's not very good, <laughs> but <laughs> it, 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 has, it, has the same cal it has the same type of calcium content, it has the same vitamin D, uh, and it has the same macronutrients, which is very important, because if we gave someone crackers, it, it's just not the same as, as, as yogurt. Uh, we, so uh, what we did for this study was assign people to yogurt, yay, or soy pudding uh, <laughs> uh, groups. Uh, we included obese and non-obese individuals in, in our study and asked them to consume 12 ounces of yogurt a day, which is one and a half cups, about half of the recommended dairy uh, servings, uh, for nine weeks. And we provided them uh, this food over the study. At the beginning and the end of the study, this is kind of unique, we gave them a large meal to induce inflammation. Uh, so we can study how the body is responding to some sort of inflammatory insult. And, and I'll get into the results of that in, in a little bit. Um, but for now, I first want to discuss like, well, what actually happens to your, pla your biomarkers in your plasma after you eat yogurt or soy pudding for, for nine weeks? And we would expect in obese individuals that there would be some sort of greater uh, anti-inflammatory uh, response. Um, this is just so you can see what we, what we gave them. Uh, there, is, there are a lot of calories here, so um, we advise them, you know, you want to take out some snacks, you want to get down to, um, you know, the maintaining your normal dietary consumption. Uh, but uh, this was uh, yogurt that was formulated with added sugars, so it did provide a um, significant amount of calories here for, for the 12-ounce serving. And uh, what happened was, uh, after nine weeks of consumption, when we look at how the, these groups changed, um, that soluble CD14, which was our primary study outcome, uh, did not change. Uh, however, the, the LBP the, to SCD14 ratio uh, showed some improvement in yogurt consumers. So this actually uh, went down. As I mentioned, the more C SCD14 you have, the better it's going, it's going to be in detoxifying endotoxin. And actually, the, you can see in the obese control and the non-obese control, this ratio actually increased. And it also increased in the, in the non-obese, but in, in the obese, it actually decreased. Uh, the, the endocab, these are the antibodies which bind to the endotoxin. Um, it's, the more you have, uh, the, the less likely you are exposed to significant um, bacterial endotoxins increased in both obese and non-obese individuals. So this suggests that there are some protective uh, effects in regarding uh, the LPS or bacterial endotoxin um, activity, although SCD14 did not change. Uh, we, we did not see uh, large changes in these inflammatory, this inflammatory cytokine IL-6 or the CRP, as I mentioned. However, TNF-alpha, uh, which you, you may recognize as uh, being an important uh, drug target, uh, was, was the, the activity of TNF was reduced. So this is a, um, the pro-inflammatory component of TNF, and then there's a, a soluble protein which um, also inhibits the acti activity of TNF. So that ratio actually decreased uh, more so when consumers consumed the yogurt, uh, both obese and, and non-obese. Um, interestingly, when we tell people eat yogurt or soy pudding, um, the obese individuals gained weight um, in, in both groups, uh, almost, a, almost a kilogram of weight. That was not true in the non-obese individuals. Uh, we also saw um, consistent reduction of diastolic blood pressure in uh, obese and non-obese, uh, about two, two mil, mil, millimeters of um, uh, mercury uh, and, and about half that for, for the non-obese consumers. <laughs> So we, we do see some modest, I'd say modest, anti-inflammatory effects here. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know how large of a breakfast you might uh, like to eat, uh, but for this study to induce inflammation, uh, we gave them uh, a, a challenge breakfast that was about 960 calories. It consisted of uh, a sausage, egg, cheese sandwich, and some hash browns. And, um, but before that, they consumed either eight ounces of the yogurt or eight ounces of the soy pudding. So we hypothesized that there would be 
some immediate effect of consuming yogurt uh, before, before a meal here. And you can see that this is IL-6, one of those inflammatory biomarkers. In the control, in the red here, you can see this, these are the time points after you consume, finish consuming the meal, so four hours. You can see that um, the, the concentration of IL-6 uh, will increase in individuals. In yogurt, that response was inhibited to, to a certain extent. Um, for the markers, that LBP uh, SED 14 ratio, we can see that um, this ratio increases in the control, but yogurt actually inhibited that after, after the meal, suggesting that the barrier function was improved in, in individuals who consumed this before eating, the, eating their yogurt or eating, eating the large challenge meal. Um, interestingly, we also saw that uh, there, are, there are effects on glucose uh, metabolism. So in the control, uh, the, this, these are in the obese individuals. They had higher glucose after the meal um, when, they the, when they consumed the control food compared to consuming yogurt pre-meal. And uh, this may also play a role in, remember I said nutrient availability is important for the function of the immune cell. So th maybe the more glucose are, that are available to tissues, the more activated those, those cells can be. Uh, we, we also um, tried to get some direct evidence from cells. Uh, we wanted to see, you know, does yogurt have a direct effect on that tissue barrier, like I, like I mentioned, some of those proteins that are holding those cells together? And the way we do that is culture um, human-derived intestinal cells. Um, they can kind of simulate a, a barrier. And then we, we look either at the resistance across that membrane or how the extent that molecules can pass through, can pass through that membrane. And in fact, uh, when we added yogurt in the presence of an inflammatory stimulus, we actually see improvements in barrier function uh, noted by electrical resistance. So, so in here, the blue is our, is our yogurt treatment. The I is when we add the inflammation. So uh, we can see that inflammation will reduce that uh, resistance across the membrane. It will increase the flux of these molecules and, and yogurt effectively inhibited that process. Um, you, we, we can look directly at the cells, and in, in yogurt we saw it improving the expression of the tight junction. So the, the tight junctions are these proteins that hold the cells together, that make up that barrier in the green here. This is a gluten, this is a particular protein here. Uh, actin is the inside of the cell, uh, DAPI is the nucleus, and we, when you overlay them you can see that green is that barrier. You can see that uh, when we label these proteins, um, we have more in the, in, when, the, when we apply the yogurt to the cells in the presence of that inflammatory stimulus. So we have some, some direct evidence from humans, um, some indirect evidence uh, from cells, uh, demonstrating that yogurt has a modest anti-inflammatory benefit in fasting plasma, uh, both in lean and obese women, to a, um, more so in the, in the obese, since we had probably more effects on the, on the uh, glucose there and some of the, some of the cytokines, which I, which I didn't mention here. Uh, but uh, our hypothesis that um, gut health is related to the anti-inflammatory mechanism of dairy seems to, seems to, to hold up to a certain extent by, by, by these results. So I want to use this point to transition to the discussion of, of A2 milk because uh, A2 milk has really been um, hypothesized to be a function of what happens in, in the gut. And uh, some of you may be aware of uh, books or um, some studies that have been published in, in this area. But I want to explain you know, about the mechanism, what the hypothesis behind this, this is. Um, A1 and A2 milk have slightly different uh, proteins in the, in the beta casein molecule. The claim from this book and, and some other researchers are that um, A1 types of protein, milk proteins, produce uh, a peptide called beta casomorphine 7, which will induce inflammation in the gut, and uh, when it passes that gut barrier, will cause opioid like effects and, and stimulate chronic in inflammation. Um, the idea is that. Uh, the hypothesis is that A2 milk, the protein uh, is, is slightly different from A2 and you won't get that BCM7 production. 
And, and you've probably seen the cons consumer uh, articles uh, ri written about this. Um, so the, the claims are really either anti-inflammatory, preventing digestion, uh, pre preventing digestive discomfort associated with drinking milk. And this is, this is very separate from lactose intol intolerance here. Uh, <clears throat> and, and literature from um, producers uh, of A2 milk uh, kind of hi highlight um, what, what this hypothesis is. So uh, mil uh, cattle or cows that, that have um, an A2 type of background have a slightly different amino acids from A1 or A1, A2 uh, mixed genotypes. And when you zoom in on, on the protein in milk, uh, one of the major proteins is this beta casein. Uh, in, in a 250 milliliter glass of milk, you've got about 11 grams of protein. Uh, two and a half grams of that is the beta casein. There's actually, between the A1 or A2 genotypes, there is a one amino acid difference in the beta casein pro, uh, protein. This is just a, a picture from another research group um, that put together the structure of, of beta, beta casein. Uh, what happens is when you digest the protein, or when someone will digest the protein, it's subjected to proteolysis. And proteolysis are these enzymes working to release first peptide fragments, and then eventually um, a, a individual amino acids that can be absorbed across the, the gut barrier. Uh, one of these uh, protein, or one of these peptide chains that gets released is uh, beta-casomorphine 7. And the hypothesis is that uh, A2 milk is more resistant because of that amino acid substitution, and A2 milk will not produce the beta casomorphine upon digestion. Uh, but uh, the counter argument uh, someone might make to this hypothesis is that, well, y you know, these peptides get further broken down uh, into individual amino acids, so we don't have a lot translocating. Uh, the gut barrier. Uh, secondly, um, when, we act, when uh, um, human digestive enzymes are used, it seems like a lot of the evidence for beta casomorphine appearing in these model digests, I mean, we can't just go into someone's intestine and take a large sample and analyze it. There have, really have not been uh, very many studies about that. Uh, but when um, some people have collected human digestive sera and uh, added these two, it seems like the, the A2 hypothesis is, is not uh, as strongly supported uh, since in A2 milk, uh, BCM7 can be released. And this is a, a recent study in the International uh, Dairy Journal showing that uh, A2 uh, milk had less BCM7, but it wasn't that there was none uh, present. And this is just after you add the human digestive enzymes with the proteins, what's really going on. Realize that these would be further subjected to uh, proteolysis at the level of the enterocyte cells. So th these would get broken down into to, um, simpler amino acids. Um, and in fact, uh, this A2, the claims about A2 milk and casomorphines um, being present in foods, actually not, all, not just milk has these uh, beta casomorphines, was reviewed by the um, European uh, Food Safety Authority in 2009, it was, it was some time, it was a, a little bit of time ago, um, but they concluded that um, really the, the hypothesis that you'd be, uh, 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 people would be absorbing a lot of these, um, and, and it was really linked to a lot of chronic diseases uh, was not held up. So there's really no concern from the, from the EFSA agency about uh, the presence of, of beta casomorphines in, in the food supply. Uh, but what about recent studies? in this area, so I just want to highlight a couple, a couple of studies that have uh, come up in, in uh, the, last, the last couple of years about this area. Uh, one study um, <clears throat> involved Chinese uh, adults who had self-identified milk intolerance, and what they did was give them a mixed A1, A2 milk uh, for two weeks, and then what we call crossover. Uh, they had a washout to so where they did not consume the milk, and then two weeks later they consumed A2 milk. And you know, uh, one group started with the A1, A2, another group started with the A2, and so you kind of get rid of those time types of effects. Um, this, uh, the authors of the study labeled this study exploratory, and that has to do with what pre-specified uh, biomarkers you're looking at, 
um, and just the nature of the study. So they still regard this as exploratory. Um, the results saw um, no difference in inflammatory biomarker H HSCRP. Um, they actually looked for this peptide BCM, BCM7. Uh, there was no difference between um, the two groups consuming, uh, consuming these. Um, they did see some changes in um, some inflammatory biomarkers. So IL-4 uh, was increased in the A1, A2 consumers by about 20%. Uh, GI discomfort was noted to uh, be decreased by, uh, by A2 milk. Uh, and in another study, the uh, administered in Australian adults, uh, also giving a, this is actually giving pure A1 milk, um, followed by a washout, and then giving A2 milk, or, or the, the different timing of the treatment, also a crossover study. Uh, they looked at fecal calprotectin, uh, no change in the inflammatory, that inflammatory biomarker, no change in gastrointestinal discomfort. Uh, but they did change, they did find a significant change in the Bristol stool scale. Anyone know what the Bristol stool scale is? Well, I've got a fun picture. <laughs> you know, uh, <laughs> it'd be great if everyone, everyone was type four, you know, giving you the thumbs up. Um, but type three is okay too. And, you know, the changes that they noted here um, were still within the normal. I just want to point, point that out, um, the difference between these, um, these groups. Um, uh, really a limited, a limited amount of uh, clinical human intervention studies. These are uh, some of the other major ones that have looked at either plasma cholesterol, um, no change between A2 or A, A1 or A1, A2 milk, um, no change in constipation in children who had chronic fun functional constipation when they were given A2 milk. Um, you know, uh, um, it's, it's important to kind of consider the, the, whole, the whole field of evidence when, when we're looking at this, whether it supports or disproves, or it's not really an adequate test of the hypothesis. Um, so uh, I just want to start wrapping, wrapping this up, saying that um, in, the, in this whole area of A2 milk um, being, a, um, or non-A2 non milk being pro-inflammatory, it doesn't seem like that hypothesis is, is well supported with the evidence that we, that we currently have. Um, similarly, for reducing cholesterol or changing, di di changing di um, increasing, improving digestion. Um, furthermore, it's really not advised to be making claims on product labels um, m mentioning about inflammation, given that that's a drug-like action. And really the same for anti-inflammatory effects of dairy. Um, really, this is an underlying mechanism of how dairy, dairy consumption could prevent chronic disease risk in, in, in a healthy population. But a medicinal effect, uh, it's really not advised to be making, making claims. I, I moved the, the anti-inflammatory effects of general dairy consumption up because of a systematic review that was conducted um, um, earlier this year. And I just want to read this because you probably can't see it, but it says, this is a group of, of experts who reviewed this area, looked at all the clinical evidence. Is that taken together, our review suggests that dairy products, in particular fermented products, have anti-inflammatory properties in humans, not suffering from allergy to milk, in particular in subjects with metabolic disorders. So I don't want to say that this is consensus in the field, but we're moving probably you know, into greater emerging or toward scientific agreement when you get these types of systematic reviews, meta-analysis of experts uh, summarizing, summarizing these claims. Does this mean? All dairy, uh, you know, we, we don't know. The, the, uh, the dose, the population, all this probably has some sort of effect. But as I mentioned before, um, there is consensus that um, three cups of dairy per uh, 2,000 kilocalories of diet is part of a healthy dietary pattern in the U.S. Um, that's straight from the, from the U.S. dietary guidelines. Also, um, health claims about calcium and vitamin D for preventing osteoporosis in healthy uh, po healthy, healthy population, that's also consensus and an allowable uh, U.S. F FDA claim that you can put on product, product labels. Um, so so where, is this where is this kind of headed? You know, if we're not going to be able, to, are we going to be able to make drug-like claims? I mean, in an area of deregulation, uh, maybe. Uh, you know, can medical foods be developed, be prescribed? Yes. Uh, they, they could be if there's a reproducible impact on disease state. 
there's just not the scale of investment in this type of research that is really going to raise food to the levels of drugs unless someone can monetize it. I think that's just the reality of, of our economy now. Uh, but we do have health claims which can reduce disease risk in healthy individuals, and some of these are, are well, well accepted. Um, but what's not really the norm at this point is to really have a detailed understanding of the population that consumes the type of food. Like, what are their genes? What are their diets? The enzymes that may be different between different people, their lifestyle choices, their medications, their environment. Um, are there specific dietary recommendations for um, specific uh, background factors that might make sense? The field is moving toward this, um, and, and the expanding field of genomics, uh, metabolomics, um, a better understanding of the immune system is, is, is helping move foods in, the, in this direction. And so I think that's kind of a future vision uh, for, uh, for, for, this, for this area. Uh, but really, we don't have that type of claim you know, uh, available on foods or food labels at, at this point. There really is, is not that, that level of evidence. Uh, so, so with that, I'd like to, to uh, wrap up and acknowledge that you know, the, these studies, the studies coming from our lab were really supported by a, a number of graduate students, collaborators, and um, funding from the um, National Dairy Council, that's the, the title there, and the University of Wisconsin Department of Food Science. So, uh, thank you. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so we have the next 15 or 20 minutes available for, 10 minutes available for questions. Uh, so, the, so the question for those of you who may, who may not uh, have been able to hear that is, some of the proper popular press articles mention the benefits of A2 milk for cardiovascular disease and, and cancers. What, are, what is the evidence or are, are people looking at that at this point? Um, that type of evidence actually, to my understanding, came from epidemiological evidence. So kind of these large scale uh, studies which are, are more kind of on the association side of things, not kind of meeting that gold standard that's, that's why we saw some of those human intervention studies looking at cholesterol, um, which you know, really didn't have uh, a big effect on cholesterol for, car for cardiovascular disease risk. So um, I'd say, um, yeah, that's, that's been um, a line of evidence that's been raised um, by that, but not uh, very much human confirmatory evidence on, on that. Uh, yes? Uh, what does science say for sure about consuming yogurt and A2 milk? Uh, so for, for yogurt, I think that fits into the, uh, the consensus is that uh, three cups of dairy per uh, 2,000 kilocalories is part of that healthy, healthy lifestyle. A2 milk, um, no, I think no claims have reached that consensus point. Well, when you say no proof is, is, is kind of difficult because it, it's, it's a, uh, the evidence can be contradictory uh, from, from some of these studies. Like I mentioned, some studies may show, yeah, right. And so, so when you say um, scientific proof, I, I kind of move that toward well, what is the scientific consensus? We may have studies that may disagree, you know, like for the A2 milk, one study showed no effect on um, uh, digestive comfort, another study showed maybe there was some benefit. You know, there's, 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 there's contradictory uh, results that don't kind of have strong, strong evidence that this is having a consistent effect in, in many populations. Uh, right. I mean, what we do know, if, if you're eating three cups of dairy, um, that's part of that healthy lifestyle, which typically has reduced risk of, of chronic disease and, um, you know, also would reduce the risk of osteoporosis there. Uh, no. I mean, this is, this is really an emerging area. 
to get to that consensus, we need more human intervention studies. This is, fermented foods are, are really an interesting topic because you can have multiple microbes producing different types of, different types of products. You may have probiotic micro, microorganisms. So, um, you know, the, I, I want to try to present this not as, this is, this is, this is a field that's constantly in, in a dynamic and, and, you know, a large clinical trial, although I'm not aware of any that are, you know, presently in, being conducted, could, could, could move things in, in either direction. Okay, the, um, I noticed someone in the, in the back from before. Um, is the milk being tested or are the cows being tested and do you know who's doing the testing? Um, I, I can't give you a name of the companies that are doing the testing. I know, um, I believe uh, companies have patent, a company has patented that testing process for genotyping the cows. Um, and, and you could, not you, uh, <laughs> the royal you, uh, you know, analytical labs could have the, the capabilities to test A1 versus A2 um, milk. And in fact, um, the, you know, because a lot of milk is, is mixed, A1, A2, they've been saying, you know, well, what proportion is A1 versus, versus A2? But that uh, requires kind of a detailed uh, chemical an analysis. And I'm, I'm not, I'm sure that there, because in, in these research studies, it may be the investigators that are doing them themselves. I'm not aware of commercial labs that, that are doing that, but I don't want to say that there are, are none doing that. Uh, yeah, I, th I think that's the same um, group that has the, the, the patent on that. So there are claims also about um, inf infant formula uh, about this. Uh, yes, yeah, so, so one of the, some of the studies have used the, the A, uh, A2, 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 versus A1, um, th this one up here, the, the Aust Australian study. Uh, my understanding is that it's, it's somewhat difficult to get that, so this other Australian study has used that too. Yeah, but the dollars, yeah the, so the, the mil milk and the uh, evidence from, this, from the human intervention studies, I think does not consistently show some sort of some some sort of intoler intolerance there, Did, yeah. Right, I, like, like you said, uh, I mean, that's a point well taken. The population makes all, all the difference for this. So in, in our study, we used uh, individuals with metabolic syndrome because they already had higher, or, I'm sorry, obese individuals because they, already, they had higher levels of chronic inflammation. It's much more difficult to show some sort of anti-inflammatory effect in a healthy population than a population that already has some level of, of chronic disease. So it wasn't yeah. 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 The one study that did use that were, were um, children which had chronic functional constipation. Um, this study from the um, Crowley, published in, in Nutrients. Um, th those were children who had um, some sort of diagnosed medical condition that they um, randomized to, to, to have this. No, there was no change in, in constipation for, the, for those children. Yeah. This one? Cost, cost. I mean, you have to pay the volunteers. You have to pay the study personnel, which are closely monitoring this. Um, the, um, it, it, can, it can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars to millions of dollars to conduct a human intervention study, depending upon what the, de what the design is. Right, 
uh, you know, I, I think the, the dose is going to make, uh, is an important consideration for, for these, types of, these types of studies. That's why we used nine weeks in our study, uh, because uh, we saw that that was long enough for some of these inflammatory biomarkers to consistently, consistently change. If we would have looked at one, we, we did monitor some biomarkers over three week intervals, so, so we did see some changing at, at about three weeks, but some of, the, some of the other ones, it takes a longer, a longer time to, to change, and, and that's a very important consideration for uh, nutritional study design. So, um, you know, that's why, you know, is the hypothesis adequately tested? It's a, it's a, yeah, I mean, it depends, it depends, uh, it depends, you know, if you're trying to, trying to, to make a claim about something, you need to have a design that adequate, adequately tests that and demonstrates uh, a consistent effect in a, in a, large, popu in a po large population. That's what's going to move scientific consensus uh, toward, toward or emerging evidence toward consensus. Right, so, so, the, so the comment is, is um, from the kind of the point, the point of view is, is that um, the statements, the claims being made about A2 milk is not necessarily, uh, is more along the lines of milk that contains A1 is posing a threat to the health and well-being of, of, of consumers versus, you know, you can drink A1 and be fine and then A2 and, 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 and have some, some, sort of, some, some sort of other benefit. Um, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the, p the, point, the point is, is, is well taken, and, and certainly how the studies are uh, designed is going to be kind of very important um, to, to demonstrate uh, a, a hypothesis that is, you know, reproducible in, in kind of large uh, study populations. I, th I think the risk is making drug-like drug -like claims on foods and then getting uh, the FDA involved or FTC involved as being fraudulent activity, even if there is some merit to the hypothesis in the emerging uh, side of things, is is uh, is, a, is a threat. Yeah. So the question, the question is, ideally, what is the appropriate length of time to conduct a nutritional intervention study? And that's, that's, a, that's a fantastic question. Um, there, there have been very few studies that have employed thousands of people and have used mortality as an outcome. When you think of chronic disease risk, really the risk is dying from a chronic disease. And there has been one study about the Mediterranean diet, maybe you're aware of this study, uh, where they gave uh, participants olive oil or nuts and compared this to a low fat diet where they used primary cardiovascular mortality as an outcome. And they saw uh, benefits within five years of conducting, conducting that study. Enough benefits on the Mediterranean diet that, that they said we have to stop the study because it's unethical to have the people on the low fat diet and not get this cardiovascular disease risk benefit here. So I would say, you know, five years is almost the minimum for mortality based outcome studies. And, uh, you know, to conduct a study in thousands of people over five years, um, it's, it's, you know, it requires almost unlimited money, <laughs> like, like you said. Um, yeah. So I think, I think we can take one more question. Um, I'll be happy to stick around if anyone has, has, any, has any other questions, but is there one, one last question? Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I, I'm not aware of any studies that have looked at insulin response versus A1, A2. Yeah, I'm just not. I'm just not aware of of any study that 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 may be a reasonable approach. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you.